Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Today's video was brought to you by Predictable Revenue's Service LinkedIn Outbound. Find out how we can leverage and grow your existing LinkedIn network to book meetings into your calendar at the link below. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. My guest today is Armand Farouk, and we're going to be talking about how to manage a large sales team virtually and how to build a kick-ass discovery process. So welcome, Armand. Thank you. I'm stoked to be here. We're going to talk about disco and how to not be a horrible sales manager. So let's do it. Perfect. Definitely vital skills in any circumstance, but certainly today now that everybody's having to do things a little differently than they're used to doing. Um, so Armand, in 18 months at Carta, you went from account executive to director of sales overseeing 40 SDRs and SMB AEs. Um, you're the host of 30 Minutes to Presidents Club, a podcast focused on no-nonsense, actionable sales tactics. And prior to Carta, you went from collegiate wrestler to top 2% insurance producer to startup founder and USC's entrepreneur of the year to strategy and investments. So a pretty wild ride you've taken to get here today. Yeah, it's, it's been crazy. I'm definitely not the conventional SDR for two years, AE for two years, mid-market AE for two years thing. And so I can talk about that a little bit. And that's honestly shaped a lot of the way that I've rethought how to do sales because I think you, you tend to pick up different habits by working in different spaces. And that's why I'm a big fan of career changes when we're, when we're hiring. So I'll, I'll talk about that when we talk about our coaching cadence. Great. I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Um, and that's a great segue. What the things we're going to cover today are what skills you need to develop to shoot from AE, AE to director level. And we're going to talk about how to manage a large sales team virtually. And there's a lot of content out there on how to book a meeting, uh, whether it's cold calls, email tactics, LinkedIn. But we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to talk about actionable tactics to take your opportunities from the first meeting to the close. Awesome. Let's do it. Awesome. So Armand, you're only 27 years old and you're already a director of sales at Carta. Tell us a little bit about your career trajectory. Yeah, well, you gave a phenomenal biography and I tend to be a little bit of an introvert, but by background, two years selling insurance, two years running a startup, two years run, working in venture and then Carta. Uh, I started as an account executive. I did about 225% of my number when I first came in and they said, uh, take what you're doing, which is doing a ton of cold calls and clearly being an outbound machine and multiplied across 30 SDRs. So I took over the entire SDR organization at the time, which was 15 people, doubled the size of the organization, quintupled the pipeline gen from the team. And they said, this is going off the wall. Now go teach people how to close too. And so today I oversee the whole SDR and SMB AE beast. And we have a pretty regimented co coaching structure because I find that oftentimes sales managers are previously very strong reps who just like to ride along with deals on the back end. And that's not what you can do with somebody who just graduated college or has been an SDR for a year and now needs to close with a CFO. And so I'm happy to talk about a lot of the structures that we put in place with our team to develop our reps. That would be great. And something I think is pretty interesting and, and is going to resonate with a lot of listeners out there right now, um, you actually came into your role as director of sales virtually right off the bat because you had that team that was split in terms of geography. But there are a lot of sales directors or sales leaders out there right now who are managing these large teams and are used to having them on the floor, in the bullpen, you know, in-house and having the proximity physically to their team, but they're now expected to manage virtually for the very first time. Mm -hmm. So tell us, how do you run a team of 40 people virtually? Yeah, it, it's all about the cadence. I saw this ridiculous LinkedIn post that said, I, I haven't had a one-on-one -on -one with my manager in three weeks. And I'm like, then, then what, is, what is he doing? Like, you haven't <laughs> talked to, like, is he just sitting there and looking at the dashboard and assuming that you're doing things well? And this person was a top performer. And so to me, there are things that you do specific rep to rep, but then in the one-to-many motions, your cadence as a leader is critical. And this is also where people tend to hit their ceiling going from rep to manager to, rep to director. And so, for example, what our cadence looks like is we need something to hold people accountable to their commitments, something to keep people motivated, and then something to develop people. And oftentimes, people try to jam all of this into one one-on-one. -on -one. And so what this looks like is coaching is different from training. So at the one-to-many level, we're doing training. And so on our Monday morning meetings, we are doing a Monday morning stand-up where we have public commitments that are in a shared Google Doc, and we have check marks for every time you hit a commitment. If you don't hit the commitment, we do fun consequences that are non-mandatory. 
For example, my consequence one time was eating Greek yogurt only for an entire day, right? Okay. And so we get people, like we have fun, we, we have a good time doing it. That's also when we communicate out announcements. So every Monday morning meeting, it begins the, the it starts the beginning of the week. And a lot of leaders, like they have communication issues. Uh, they, they have a hard time getting announcements out. And so we announce everything and we start the week on a Monday and we start it on a high note with some energy. On a Wednesday, every Wednesday morning, we do a sales builder with a team. And it's some sort of skill building activity. Maybe it's cold call reviews. Maybe it's uh, somebody talking through a new talk track they're trying. Maybe it's somebody breaking down their cold emails, whatever that might be. Uh, and, and we're constantly pushing the development of the team. A lot of managers hand this off to sales enablement. To me, like if, if you're not coaching, if you're not training, then why the heck are you here? I didn't hire somebody to just sit in on deals. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that we do is we do a couple of one-off things like dial blitzes and uh, quick stand-ups with the team to keep people fresh. You got to have the constant contact, especially now you don't have the luxury of a sales floor. And fortunately, we already had this cadence in place, but it gave something for reps to latch onto when there wasn't structure. And I see so many teams floundering right now because they're trying to cobble together the structure right now and it feels forced. The moment you step onto a sales floor, you need to implement that structure on day one to show mm -hmm. your reps that you have a process for developing them. Awesome. So sales leaders that are out there now trying to develop this virtual system of, of kind of coaching and managing and training need to just set them, set out a cadence, set out a schedule and stick to it. Exactly. And, and it, it gets people in the motion of it, right? If you change it, if you do a training one week and then you do another in four weeks and then another in 17 weeks, it's, it, it ruins the momentum. Gotcha. People come in with the expectations and they plan their weeks around the Monday morning meeting, around the Wednesday morning sales builder, around the Friday dial blitz. And it gets people into a routine, which is the number one most important thing that you need for quote unquote predictable revenue is you need predictability in your routine and everything you do. Absolutely. So I'm imagining on these different calls that you have throughout the week, there's like 40 screens on Zoom. Mm -hmm. If not every single person can be participating in, in every single uh, activity or conversation, how do you keep that many people on the screens engaged? Yeah, it's it's moderately hilarious. And so we, we'll have these big, big rooms because I have a... I've, close to 30 people report, reporting into me now. And what will happen is in the commitments in the Monday morning meetings, I'll call out every single person and I ask for a quick yes, no, and how'd the week go? And I, I ask that they be really, really short because we got to get through the whole room. But mm -hmm. it gets people like talking crap to each other a little bit and you get this really fun back and forth. That said, you can't do that for everything. And so for the trainings, we're, cult, we're, we're asking people to precede questions. And so before the training, we say, hey, come, come with two or three questions that you're going to have about topic X, or come with uh, the ability to disagree with these two or three statements. And so you precede the conversations. But it's not like there, there are two bounds. There's one end, which is one-on-ones. And then there's the other end, which is full team stand-ups. We also need to do things in between because you bring up a really good point, Sarah, that you can't get a real good conversation going with 30 people. And so what we do as intermittent training activities is uh, every week we rotate different groups and we do small group disco teardowns. And so what that looks like is we'll have four, five, or six AEs in a room at a time. One AE will pull up one of their discovery tapes from Chorus or Gong or whatever software you use and we'll pause every three minutes and we'll say, hey, what should we have said here? How do you think about that differently? How should we handle this competitor? Should, be, should it be a question or an answer? And mm -hmm. with four or five or six people, I can still scale my time, but it's not such a big overwhelming group that you can't get into a discussion. And so think of as a leader, what needs to be handled one-on-one, -on -one, what needs to be handled like one to four, one to five, and then what needs to be communicated one to 30. Awesome. That, that I think is a great point because one of the questions that, that comes to mind for me as somebody that used to be with their sales manager in the same room, able to kind of tap them on the shoulder and having a lot of one-on-one -on -one time whenever I needed it. Um, with a team of this size, you can't possibly coach and critique every single thing one-on-one -on -one all the time. Yeah. Um, but another thing that kind of, uh, that I think maybe some people might think that they'd miss going from uh, in-person to virtual is um, learning from one another. So having the ability to like overhear somebody on a call and then hearing the, the feedback that they get from uh, someone else or from a manager. So how do you ensure 
uh, in this, in your situation or in everyone's newly virtual situation that SDRs can learn from each other in that way. Yeah. And so one of the things that we started doing is um, I, I was a college wrestler and we would have this thing called open mat and open mat was you could basically go into a wrestling room and you could just wrestle whoever the heck you wanted. It wasn't a formal structured practice or anything like that. And so we do open mat call reviews where we have the whole team come in and it's, it's an optional Thursday morning. And if you want to bring in a call, you can, and they're typically cold calls. And so that's a forum where, and, and honestly, the whole team comes to it anyway, because it's really cool to listen to other people call. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to have, to tell your rep to go listen to 10 cold calls on their own. It's so important to create an environment where your team can have that organic back and forth and listen to a call together. And so every single week, uh, Thursday mornings, we do an open mat call review. People bring calls to the table. They throw them on an Asana board, and we just crank through them one by one by one. And it's really the same concept with the tape teardowns, too. Mm -hmm. It's like I want other people hearing each other's opinions. I don't want people listening to call recordings in a silo. I want to hear their opinions to make sure that they're thinking about calls the right way and then to help other reps think that same way. That's great. So... With all of these meetings that you're chatting about, you've got those really big, uh, everybody on the team ones that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then you've mm -hmm. got in between those kind of medium-sized groups and then one-on-ones uh, as well. So it's okay. a pretty high-touch cadence of meetings uh, for that you have with your SDR team. So how, how do you and how can other sales managers balance all of these meetings with the other responsibilities they might have as a sales leader? Yeah. And so in, in my seat, it's a little bit different for me. If you're an SDR, if you're an AE and you have more than eight hours of meetings on your calendar, there's something going wrong. And so if there are more all hands in one week than another, I'll actually pull trainings off, not because I want to disrupt the schedule, but because I don't want to overload the reps. And so reps really should have no excuse. They need to be ruthlessly efficient with their time. To me, those that one hour or that half an hour call review will multiply across all of the deals that they sell later on. As a manager, way too many people get in the habit of thinking that being in meetings is being productive. And I was the first person to fall victim to this because I was like, I need a weekly meeting with every mid-market AE or a, every mid-market manager. I need a weekly meeting with every SMB manager. I need a weekly meeting with everybody on marketing, my VP of sales and everybody. And I literally had zero white space blocked out on my calendar. And so similar to how you need to think through what's my one-on-one, -on -one, what's my one to five and what's my one to 30, you need to think of what is my weekly, monthly, quarterly cadence. Hmm. or my not at all cadence. And way too many people have random weekly one-on-ones with people who aren't even on their team or completely other parts of the business. And so there are going to be certain things that are communicating upward as you get closer to the sun, whether you're a director or a manager, that you're going to have to do. Forecasting, right? Uh, providing product feedback. I would push you to compartmentalize those and time block those as efficiently as you can into some cadence that does not conflict with the rest of your calendar. And then I would ask that you over index on the weekly cadence with your reps and focus that time, not on just sitting and chit chatting about how you're doing, but focus that time on call reviews and on being really, really hands-on and active coaching and listening to deals go by. And then if you take all the other junk off your calendar and all the corporate bureaucratic nonsense meetings and you set this, this expectation with your marketing team that we're not going to meet with every member every single week. What remains is if you have time, you can do floor time. And it's a little bit harder in COVID time, but you can do open office hours. And there's so much that happens in that organic time where you're just listening to the floor or you're helping people with an email objection that they got at 2 p.m. and you happen to be in a one-on-one. -on -one. All of those things, you need to block time for the organic interactions, especially in this COVID environment, because otherwise they're just not going to happen. You're going to be running to meet from meeting to meeting and your team's not going to see you for the entire day. Very true. That's a conversation that I've, I've had with a few people um, because we don't have this time of like traveling between meetings for people that maybe salespeople who would have been driving out to see clients um, or even for managers, they would have had like their lunch time, And then the time that they get up and wander off to, you know, do something, we end up having our calendars just be chock a block mm -hmm. with back to back pre-scheduled meetings because we're doing our best to create some kind of routine in total uncertainty. But I think you're, you're totally right. There needs to be 
almost a bit of scheduled randomness to actually keep normalcy. Yeah. I mean, people, so the, you know, I talked about the cadence at the beginning Mm -hmm. and sometimes people take that too far. All in all that, that ends the Monday morning meeting is 30 minutes. The dial blitzes are an hour, but you're, you're doing the job. And so that's not even a meeting. Like you're, you're literally just cold calling. There's a 30 minute call review and a one hour training, right. And maybe like a, another one hour call review. And so all in all, you got two half hours and then two full hours. That's three hours meetings, right? Some people take it to like way too far. They're like, we're going to do a one hour stand up at the beginning of the day and then a 15 minute stand up at the end of the day. And then we're going to do trainings and all this stuff. I'm like, guys, like at some point we've got to sell here, but you need to make yourself available because that's your job as a manager. And so it's a tough, tough balance. But I, if you can't do floor time today, you got to find some substitute for that. And that substitute is not having more one-on-ones with your team where you ask them how the weather's going and how their working from home situation is going. Because I'm getting really sick of those conversations at this point. <laughs> totally makes sense. Um, earlier in the conversation, you managed, or you met, uh, mentioned somebody who had said to you they hadn't had a one-on-one in weeks and weeks. And you were saying, what's that manager doing? Are they just sitting there looking at a dashboard? And in a previous conversation, you, you said to me, you're not a dash- dashboard manager, unequivocally yeah. not a dashboard manager. So what do you think are the key things that a manager needs to be looking for instead of looking at the dashboard? Yeah. Again, so the the extremes are never good. Some people literally live inside of Salesforce. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, get, get out of that. But then other people just completely ignore the data. And that's also wrong. And so I have a very, very simple Salesforce dashboard. And I have one dashboard that I use for most things. And I call it the inputs dashboard. And it literally walks me from beginning to end, rep by rep, what is going on? And so beginning, how many demo requests did they get? Uh, where, where's their top of the funnel coming from? How many dials did they make? How many emails did they send? How many meetings did they have? How many meetings actually kept? How much pipe did they create? How much pipe was closed? And then what does that look like on a month over month basis? And so I can use that to understand and diagnose where I need to coach. So for example, if somebody is looking low on the month, I'm going to look at their pipe gen. I might fight and their pipe gen is low. I'm going to look at their their top of funnel. I might find that their top of funnel is fine. And so I'm like, well, are they just not working their leads properly? And then I might find that their dials are low or they're on their dials. They're not converting really well. And that's when I go in and do a call review with them. And so you use the dashboard to diagnose, to pick apart the different parts in the sales cycle where someone can mess up. But then you get out of the dashboard and you start coaching and you might find that it was something different but you got to use it to diagnose where you might have a problem and then you got to get off of it. Awesome. That totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So the, the next thing that we wanted to talk about was, uh, instead of kind of focusing on the initial booking, the meeting and the kind of, um, we kind of chatted before, if you, if you Google like great cold call tactics or how to book a meeting, everybody is sharing really amazing stuff. There are so many different, uh, thought leaders on LinkedIn that are, giving all of these really incredible and actionable ways to go about that, depending on what industry you're working in or or who you're targeting, what you're selling. Um, But what we don't get a lot of out there is, is content for AEs on the discovery process. So let's talk about actionable tactics for building a strong discovery process. So you've gotten your first meeting. How do you manage that op from meeting to close? Yeah, let's take it beginning to end. So this is, it's crazy. There are so many, there's uh, the, the fanatical prospecting book. There are so many different prospecting playbooks out there. But to your point, like no one's really cracked the code on discovery. There are a couple of really good books that I can recommend. Um, and, and, and let me tell you what not to do. A lot of reps will get into a call. And this happened to me the other day where someone was trying to sell me software. I got on the call. He was like, well, well look, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, let me let me pull up these slides, and so I so I can share a little bit about our company, uh, and then we'll do a demo, and then and then we'll open up for questions. And I was just like, okay, like you got an introduction from a guy who probably who who is in an engineering function, so he knows nothing about my business, and you're assuming that I have a general sense of like how you can be helpful to me and all of that stuff, and so you're just going to start pitching me on day one. Nobody gives a damn about your product or your pitch or your stupid slide deck or anything like that. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to see your logo slide or your, your history or that your, your founder likes uh, Poupon Gray mustard instead of Dijon, right? Nobody cares. And so 
it starts from the agenda. And the way you need to start the agenda is people get in these long winded agendas that sound super, super salesy. I got to do three things. The first thing is I, I want to give you a sense of where it's going. And what that means is I want to I let you know that I'm going to ask you some questions and I'm not going to show you software. The second thing is I want to anchor you to specific outcomes. And so that means that it's okay for you to give me a no. And then the last thing is I, I want you to buy in. And, and that's what I got to accomplish. And people do all these crazy things. For me, what it sounds like is like, look, Sarah, you're the star today. Honestly, I, I don't have much of a presentation or a deck to go through. My, my goal is to understand you. And so I'm going to ask you a couple questions along the way to understand your business, to see exactly what I should show you, or frankly, if I should show you anything at all. And then at the end of this, we'll have five minutes left at the end. And, and I, I would just hope that you'd be open enough to tell me if you think this is even moder moderately relevant for you. Is that fair? Yes. No. Great. On that note, uh, you, you came inbound for X, Y, and Z reason. If you were going to get two things out of the call today, like what do you want to make sure that I cover? And that's literally the agenda. It doesn't feel super salesy, but it's structured enough that it gets us on the right page. That's great. So there's our agenda. Any questions on that before we go into questioning skills and things of that sort? I think that's, yeah, that's really great. We try to do a lot of agenda setting as well, of course, when, when uh, people come in through inbound, because yeah, there's, there's a specific path that that call kind of needs to take from SDR to AE or whatever that might be. But I think that's a really nice way of doing it. Um, what do you, what do you want to make sure that we cover? That's nice. Yeah. And so then after that, you start to get into the different questions, right? And it's the same type of thing where like people uh, screw up discovery all the time because that's the agenda, which is moderately separate from discovery. But mm -hmm. people will start with these super, super high level open-ended questions. Again, both of the polls are wrong. They'll start with these high level questions where it's like, tell me about your priorities or like, tell me about your business. And it's like, dude, did you not like look at me on LinkedIn? Like, did you not look at my website? Or you're talking to like someone three rungs down the ladder, the ladder in the the CFO's organization. And it's like, I don't want to tell you that stuff. I'm here to like, have you solve my problems. The other end of the spectrum is they either get pulled into way, way, way too deep into the technical weeds of like, uh, do you, when you click here, are you clicking t uh, the blue button or the red button and all that stuff? Or even worse, they get into these crazy impact questions right off the bat, where it's like, how much money are you going to disclose to your board that you're losing? Or like, what would you do with uh, if you had 17 more hours in your calendar, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect? And it just sounds super, 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 super canned. And so I like to ease into it a little bit. And a lot of people like to start with situational questions, which is also where I tend to start because I want to get a little bit of lay, the lay of the land so I know what type of questions to ask you afterwards. But you need to get off of those quickly. And so if you start with situational questions, they might sound something along the lines of, how are you managing X process today? Who else is involved in that? A, B, C, X, Y, Z, whatever that might be. Don't need to ask a ton of questions there. I can base those questions based off of, I know there are two or three outcomes in each of my different pain funnels. And I know if someone is managing something on spreadsheets, they tend to have problems like X and Y. And then I can start to ask them problem questions and get off of the situational questions as soon as I possibly can. And so a lot of people will, they'll, they'll, they'll get caught up and they'll think, oh, I got a sale. And I'm like, great, what did you know? What was the problem that your customer told you that they had? And they're like, well, they're on spreadsheets. And, and that's not a problem. If you're on a competitor, being on a competitor is not a problem. You might know that that competitor has security issues and your data is at risk and all of that stuff, but you didn't get them to say it. You didn't get them to admit it. You're putting the pieces together because you know that typically someone on spreadsheets tends to have problems like X, Y, and Z, but you didn't get them to say it. And that's exactly how you ask pain questions. And so you use what I call typically language. And so typically when I talk to people who are on spreadsheets, it's either going really well or things like A, B, or C tend to happen. Are any of those even like moderately relevant for you guys? And I can start to narrow them down the different paths. I know that people who are on spreadsheets tend to either A, have their law firm really involved to make sure that they're not wrong, or B, manage it themselves, which takes a lot of their time. And then I can take them one layer deeper as to how much time or how much does that cost? And I can start to amplify it. How much does it cost? How often are you doing that? Right? 
Does that even matter? Is that a large sum of capital for you guys? Or is this a drop in the bucket? And until I, the, the pain questions tend to reveal things around time or cost or, or, or money or things like that. But then I've got to get into impact questions. And the fundamental thing behind impact questions are, do you even care, right? Of all the problems that you have, right? If I could give you $2,000 back in legal fees, is that something that is worth the time of implementing, implementing the software? Or do you have something else that's like, got your hair on fire? Are you about to do uh, $5 million of layoffs and this isn't even moderately relevant for you? And so impact gives me a general sense of where does this weigh in the broader spectrum of everything that you have. And that's how you ask impact questions. You don't ask me like these ridiculous questions like, what would you do with $50,000 more in revenue? You get a sense of how much they actually give a damn about the pain. And that's how you sell the software. Amazing. So that's, that's the riff on that. And then the last thing that you do to cinch it all together is uh, you, you start asking your closing questions at the end. So once I've, I, I don't like people will like do this crazy bant thing at the front end of the process. It's like your first question is like, have you allocated a budget thing for budget for this? It's like, dude, like you, you cold called me. I requested a demo. I don't even know what this costs. They'll be asking timeline. Well, the timeline is never if they don't believe that they have a problem. But now that I've got you to believe that you have a problem, I can say like, hey, like, are, are you, is this a big enough problem that it's worth spending a little bit of money on it? Right? How does this feel from an economic standpoint? Do you feel like the ROI is there for you? Right? If you were going to solve this problem, when was the latest time that you would want to solve this problem that you've agreed upon? How can I help you get there? How can I back out our implementation timeline to make sure that you have enough time to meet this deadline? And now I can start narrowing them down to a specific date, time, and dollar amount. But you don't get to do any of that until you do all of the pain discovery on the back end. And then, and then you can show them software, <laughs> but only then. And what you show them is literally just to validate that the solutions for your problems are not absolutely crazy. I'm not lying. I'm just showing you that what I was telling you is actually true about how I can solve your problems. Got it. So to kind of look back over that discovery process, you want to set the agenda and you want to make it about them. It's not about showing the software. It's about really digging down to figure out what pains they have and how you can solve them. Then you've got your situational questions, which you want to keep pretty short before you move ahead to the pain questions. And you're using things like the typically questions. So typically when I talk to people, this is the situation or this mm -hmm. is the situation. Um, then you're moving to your impact questions, which are to figure out if they even care about everything that you've outlined thus far. And then after that, you get to go into those closing questions, which are the traditional qualification questions like the BANTs or the medic or med picks. And then exactly. only after you've nailed all of that, they do care, you've discovered that they qualify with all of your BANT or medic or whatever, then you can show them the software to confirm that you can help. Phenomenal recap. Well done. <laughs> nice. That's a great, good kind of step-by-step -step process that I think a lot of AEs will be able to imp implement pretty quickly. And I'm sure a lot of them are already doing these types of questions, but maybe in not, not in this quite exact order, or maybe um, not with the right focus on the right types of questions. So that's amazing. Thank you so yeah. much for, for that process. And if I can give one, one piece of advice is there's a book called Gap Selling, which has a lot of the similar concepts, phenomenal book, a guy named Keenan wrote it. And the way that you can start to figure out what questions to ask. So I've given you high level situational pain and impact questions is build out a chart that says, these are the common situations. There are usually three or four things that buckets that I need to dig into with my prospect. These are typically one or two pains associated with each. And these could be possible impacts associated with each. And then your questioning trees are not a script. It's just you pulling them across the mm -hmm. chart and understanding where they might fit in the spectrum. And so don't use a script, understand what situations can lead to from a problem standpoint, and then what things tend to happen if they have those problems and then just organically ask questions from left to right. Perfect. Well, my last kind of question for today, um, you obviously have this wrestling background, collegiate wrestler. Uh, you also were a wrestling coach uh, at a studio or, or gym, I guess you'd call it in LA. Yeah. Um, so tell us what 
lessons from the wrestling world have helped you get where you are today? Yeah, the, the number one thing, I mean, you've got the competitiveness and the, the fact that sales, as people say, it's a team sport, sort of, it's an individual sport. It is the anti-group project, which is why I went into sales. And as an individual wrestler, it, it, I mean, there's nothing like going and beating an opponent and knowing that I was the only person that got to do that. Conversely, losing meant you were the only person to lose. You're the only person to miss your quota. That's a little bit less actionable. What is most actionable for the audience that I'd like to share is uh, your, your routine. And so you've got to nail down ultimate discipline process from the moment you wake up to the moment you close your laptop. What you do afterwards, I don't really care. But when you wake up in the morning, you got to set your day up for success. And I was a, a fat kid in high school with like no confidence and like overweight and all the different problems that you could say. And, and it started to turn around for me when I got my routine down. And so what my routine looks like today is I wake up at 6am. Fortunately, I don't have kids, so I don't have to deal with like waking up the kids and all that stuff. I wake up at 6 a.m., I wash my face. And by the way, I wake up on the first news because if you don't, if you press snooze three times, you are telling yourself that I'm willing to repeat the worst part of the day over and over and over. Just get it over with, man. Count down three, two, one, lift off and explode yourself out of bed, right? The next thing I do is I wash my face, I come back to my bed, I make the bed. You might have heard the, the one general who made that speech about how making your bed gives you the first small win in the day, which will lead to many, many more wins. At that point, I'm drinking pre-workout just because I, I need that to get my day going. And while I'm drinking pre-workout, I'm reading a book. And I'm focusing the day on starting on my terms instead of somebody else's terms. And then I do some exercise. And by the time that I get in, I've already gotten two hours of me time out of the way and I'm lit and locked and loaded to start the day. And if you just like crawl out of bed and the first thing you do is you have someone like me breathing down your neck, telling you to make more dials, telling you you screwed up a sales call, and that's how you start your day. Way too many people start their day with the first thing being I'm starting my day as late as possible so that I don't get fired, I don't get my kids taken away from me, I don't get divorced, whatever that might be. You gotta start the day on your own terms. Hmm. And that was something that was ingrained into my head through wrestling. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything that you did on this call. It was amazing. You talked about uh, the skills that you developed to get you from AE to uh, director of sales. We chatted about how to manage such a large SDR team or our team of account executives now virtually. Um, and then finally, that really, really actionable, uh, the actionable tactics for discovery. So that kind of it was a, a kind of a five-step process that we went over there of how to get really, really strong discovery calls. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Yeah, two, two big ways. So the first way is uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm packaging here is I tend to splice it up into little bits and I release it on LinkedIn. And so I post a ton on LinkedIn. Come and follow me. I'm, I'm the only Armand Froak. I have sort of a weird name, so come and find me. Uh, the second way is uh, we, we run this awesome podcast called 30 Minutes to President's Club. It's 30 minutes, no nonsense, actionable tactics. Everything is actionable. It's no nonsense, no theory. And so follow us on that. Please give us feedback if you get the chance to listen to an episode. And uh, this show is also an awesome one as well. So please make sure that you continue listening to Sarah and the rest of the guests that come on board. Thank you so much. And you mentioned the book Gap Selling by Keenan. So we'll also make sure to share the link to that. That's an awesome one for uh, discovery process. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Armand. It was great chatting from you. Great to hear about your such varied experience. And I'm looking forward to having you again on the show down the line. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you. All right. Shout out to Predictable Revenues, Service LinkedIn Outbound, service for sponsoring this video. As a founder and sales leader myself, I, I know most of the best practices in terms of like what I need to be doing on LinkedIn, um, but sometimes I just don't have the time. Um, you know what the right things to do are, but it just... It comes down to a trade-off of what's what's a better where, where's my time better spent um, and can I find somebody to do to click around on LinkedIn for me and book meetings you know and then I can focus on higher level activities um, and so think about it what's the best use of your time if you're a founder sales leader and you have a team you need some meetings I'd encourage you to check it out um, I'm using it myself I'm obviously the founder so eating our own dog food um, but if you're curious click the link below to learn more. Thank you.